You're listening to episode 245 of the Comics Pals. We're a group of comic book journalists and friends who record a podcast together because we don't talk enough about comics in our daily lives. You have to do that so loud, Sean? Ah, mm. That was like a lower energy <sighs> effort. Ah, man. I just got kicked out of the Hellfire Gala. Why? Just? Yeah, I was there for two weeks. I really overextended my welcome. Um, I'm really uh, hungover. Uh, it was a one night thing. Yeah, well, maybe for everyone else it was. Where did you stay? <laughs> I stayed at the Summers little base on the moon. Um, oh, with Gene, Logan, and Scott. Yeah, and I tried to kind of get in on that finally. Of course, I thought I thought finally. they were all kind of giving me signals. I know what happened. <laughs> Nothing happened. In fact, uh, they seem pretty offended by the fact of me kind of propositioning myself into that uh, three-way situation. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You have to it's imagine. How and I feel. Well, right now. I, yeah, of course. I have to imagine though that they're the most stale polyamorous couple throuple ever. Yeah, every night the three of them just sit down and watch like reality shows on Netflix. Like every night it's the Great British Bake Off and it's just like, really guys? But like the first season from like 2012 or whatever. So like not even the good seasons. Yeah, I'm trying to like party up there and I'm like, this guy over here with the claws and all the hair, he's, this guy smells so bad. You know, he gets down. Well, See, I don't think he does. Dicks. And that's right. He has two dicks. Really? No one told me that. I, like I said, I was trying. To, I was down the clown. I was trying to get in there, but here I am. I got the biggest hangover ever because Jean Grey decided to like get in my brain, and here I am trying to wake up. Well, good luck with that. Um, Thanks. Um, yeah, Pete and Marco were trying to go like come rescue me. I don't know what happened to them though. They're not here though, so everything t- clearly took a left turn. Yeah, they're on a rack. They'll be home soon. That's where they belong, soon, frankly. Never... Yeah, yeah. We had we had to split things off. Uh, it was just getting too rowdy here. We needed them gone. They're on a racco now. If you would have told me that Marco's from Mars, I would have been like, yeah, that makes sense. Exactly. <laughs> um, we have a lot to talk about today. Phil, Kale, and I are holding down the fort as the other two are off. Well. On Araco, mm-hmm. and uh, I guess we'll see them next week or something. But uh, today we're going to be talking about Grant Morrison's plans uh, once Superman and the Authority wraps up. Uh, what the reviews are looking like for Black Widow, if you can believe Black Widow is out next week. Insane. Uh, it's 15 months in the making, basically. It's, I think it's more than that. It's been two years. Wow. Yeah. The last Unreal. Marvel movie came out two years ago. Unreal. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we're going to be talking about the sale of comic books in 2020. Uh, it was a huge conversation piece last year. Like, how were comics selling? Would the industry even be alive? And now we know not only is it alive, not only did it do all right, in 2020 but it's thriving oh did marvel Um, finally sell that one million copy issue no (laughs) not at all uh so we're going to talk about that and uh, based on that data answer the question should the industry move away from single issues so we've got a lot to talk about today before we get into all that i do want to let you guys know where you can find us all over the internet of course we are the comics pals this show that you're listening to right now drops every single monday uh and you can expect us to do news like what i just broke down we have interviews always uh with great creators we just did one with um jeremy holt that's jeremy right. holt yes absolutely. is that right yes jeremy holt okay. thank you it's early guys and i am trying <laughs> um yeah yes jeremy holt uh, we've done we've done a lot of a lot of interviews with a lot of really cool people. Uh, so if you like that stuff, check out our backlog. We've probably interviewed a creator who you're a fan of. 
Um, our reviews for comics drop every Wednesday on the image side, and then everything else drops every Sunday. So check that stuff out. Uh, book club wise, we just put out our multiversity book club. Mm. Uh, and that was, that was awesome. Um, and this month, the month of July, we are putting out suicide squad. Yes. Uh, that was, that was a fun read. And I think multiversity turned out excellent. Anyone that's a big Grant Morrison fan who, uh, will go into greater detail in the news about, uh, I think that's a must read for you and a must listen, uh, for everyone that likes this podcast of ours. The Suicide Squad book club is based on Tom Taylor's run. Mm, yeah. uh, the 11 issues that he did with Bruno Redondo and uh, a couple of other artists that uh, helped out. Um, really good stuff. And I think you guys are going to want to hear that. We'll keep reminding you about it. Uh, it's a very fun book club. If yeah. you want to write to the show, do so at thecomicspals at gmail.com. Uh, if you want to support the show, make sure that you hit that follow button. Uh, leave us a rating or a review wherever you're listening to this. Well, if that happens to be YouTube, uh, subscribe to the channel for free. Uh, like the video, share with your friends, drop us a comment. And of course, hit the notification bell so you can be made aware of when we drop new content. All of that is free to do, and it helps us out a lot more than it costs you. Uh, by the way, listen to our Loki reviews. Run those numbers up. If you're watching Loki, you definitely want to hear our thoughts. No spoilers, but um, Kale was right. Oh, what? Listen. Kale was right. A clock is right twice a day. It just so <sighs> happens like... this one is right three or four times a day. Mm, I feel like it's the opposite. I feel like you're not much of a clock at all. I don't think you're right twice a day even. <laughs> if you ask my wife, that's what she'd say. <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> Jesus. Um yeah, so Kale was right about Loki. Go listen to our episode four review to find out how, because I'm sure he, you know, bragged. I guess I'll have to listen to find out as well, because I, <laughs> I also don't remember. You that don't tracks. remember how you were right? No, please. That don't. Tracks. What was I the do. mid credit scene of Loki? Oh, oh my God. Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. Hmm. yeah. I, called I that mean, in the first episode. Yeah, okay. I guess. Kale is like, I'm right all the time. You, I mean, you know what what's thing? so fucking crazy? I'm trying to give you credit. Yep. I'm trying to big you up, and you're like, yeah, okay, yeah. <laughs> I have to. I, I, no matter what, you can big me up all you want. I will forever remain this small, either Going by back, my own doing or by anybody else's. Right. Your wife can vouch for that, too. That cuckoo <laughs> and your cuckoo clock ain't working right. Oh, my goodness. Oh, uh, um. <laughs> cuckoo in my cuckoo clock now you know you, you just you know how much i care about you guys nope i didn't spoil the way in which kale was right about yeah, loki that was nice that's a nice thing to do right mm -hmm. so wouldn't you say that if i did spoil it that would just be like disrespectful like to that a would listener be to a listener yeah yeah fan, i mean yeah the general like public yeah Right, yeah. So, color me surprised. When I log on to Twitter uh, on Wednesday and I see a spoiler, a massive spoiler, the spoiler of all spoilers, in fact, for uh, Hellfire Gala, for the end of the Hellfire Gala, oh. for... This very comic book that I hold in my hands, X Factor number 10. Do you do I read X Factor? No. I bought this comic book because I was promised the resolution, the inciting incident for the trial of Magneto. Okay. And we all knew that was coming, so that's not a spoiler. The the spoiler is who dies. Yeah. Who, who did Magneto kill? And they put it on Front Street. They put it on Front Street. They said. This person is dead. Enter the trial of Magneto with a picture, a picture of Magneto holding the person in his arms. Ooh, was this so from... you couldn't even misconstrue yep. what happened? Was this it from was in your face? Marvel or one of the X Men people? Marvel. It was from Marvel. Oh. Yeah, it was, Marvel. It was, it was oh. a whole ad thing. Damn. Yeah. Damn. That's I couldn't believe brutal. it. It was Wednesday. Okay. Mm -hmm. It was Wednesday. I hadn't had the chance to make it 
to the shop yet, but it was Wednesday. The day I can't is even have what? Can you stop interrupting me for two <laughs> seconds, Phil? Shut up. It was Wednesday. I can't even get to the shop before I get spoiled. Like, what the fuck is Marvel thinking? Who, what intern thought it was a good idea to post that the same day that the book came out? This isn't DC Comics, okay? The books drop Wednesday. Oh, right. I see. Mm -hmm. That's brutal. They have a long history of doing this. You're right. You're absolutely right. They do. They did this shit to me with Captain America. Mm -hmm. Okay? They did this shit to me with Captain America again when he said Hail Hydra. Mm -hmm. All right? And now they did it with Trial of Magneto. We're not going to say who it is. We're going to give you one week. We'll talk about that in one week. But if you already know who it is, chances are it's because of Marvel. And I'm sick of this shit. Give us one day. Mm -hmm. That's all I'm asking for, Marvel. It's like they're shooting themselves in the foot. Like, oh, they don't like money? No one's going to go buy the book now because (laughs) it's on Front Street. Well, they're not going to go buy that book for sure. That's what I mean, yeah. Like, yeah, I mean, there. Look, look, Leo Williams has plenty of fans, no doubt about it. I have not enjoyed X Factor. I didn't like the first issue. That was enough for me. You buy this issue primarily for that, and now we know. So basically, what Marvel said is, if you buy our books monthly, and you go to the shop on time, fuck you. I don't even like to curse on this podcast, but that's how Marvel made me feel on Wednesday. Yeah, it's like they had zero confidence in X Factor, really. But why put it in that book if you don't have confidence in it? That's an interesting uh, point. Maybe they did it for, well, okay. So first of all, the reason they did it, probably the primary reason is because she will be writing the uh, Trial of Magneto. Hmm. The, 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 the book is... The, the same creative team, I think, uh, Lucas, no, okay, so it's it's Williams and Wernick. Yeah, Wernick does work on X Factor. So those two are going to be um, doing Trial of Magneto. And so, and X Factor is ending. Yeah, that was the last issue. Yeah. So I guess that's the reason. Um, I don't know. I don't think Marvel really gives a shit, yeah. frankly. There had to be another way to do it. Like, and I don't know if this is a better solution, but you know, give it a day. Go, I mean, yeah. cer- certainly. Like, if if I if I saw that on Thursday, I would have said, you know what, it's my fault. I didn't read the book. I could have read it. I didn't read it. Fine. And even even like that's annoying. It's only yeah. been a day, but like it's not the day. You want to know what's so funny? It's so funny you say that, Kill. Because on that same exact day, I saw a tweet from, um, I think it was Marvel Studios, that said, "No, it's, it's something to the effect of, don't spoil Loki, mm. the fourth episode of Loki. So the same day you're telling us not to spoil your comics, you are spoil or not to spoil your TV show, you are spoiling your comics. Unreal. Tells you a lot about the priority order there, you know? And um, I, and if the logic is like, oh, you find out this big twist in this issue, oh, you'll definitely go run out and buy it. That's not what Wrong. people do. People see the spoiler and they're like, oh, I'm good. I know what happened. Like, yeah, like you have to imagine that's their thought process. We put this out as the ad campaign or whatever, and that'll get people to go buy the trial of Magneto. Yeah. I mean, like advertising, you said, Sean, that you saw Magneto holding the person that's dead. You could have silhouetted that person, make it a mystery, make people go buy the book. Yeah, just let the let the thing be, you know, Magneto killed someone in this issue. The trial of Magneto begins whenever the hell it begins. Yeah. It just doesn't make any sense. But nah. you know what? Thanks a lot, Marvel. Uh I I I will I will take that as a sign that my my weekly Wednesday business is not as important to you as a tweet. 
have you before we move off this have you seen that the the new spider-man uh no way home designs uh are out as toys now yeah. mm-hmm. that happens a lot that drives yeah. me crazy yeah it's shocking to me that they can't like not do that they can't go to hasbro and be like hey uh can you not you know push this right now yeah like the, what's gonna sell anyway what it's not gonna sell yeah, yeah right. you don't do that right now we'll this is not out till december this kind of thing has happened for years of like movies with like big like you um then we find out about doomsday in batman v superman because of toys that mattel was pushing um i don't remember mm-hmm. it that way but that very well may be the case stuff like that is very common oh yeah absolutely venom in spider-man 3 same thing mm-hmm. yes i remember that funnily enough um the toys for No Way Home include Vulture as a villain. Um, hmm. I don't know if that's like a teaser or if that's because they, they can't show anybody else. I'm assuming hmm. that they, it's because they can't show anybody else. Maybe, yeah. They could easily resell villains from other movies in your line or whatever. <laughs> yeah. Oh, what, yeah. If it's, what if it's just uh, remade toys? <laughs> Toy, the one the vulture toys that didn't sell they're just uh they've just repackaged them maybe yeah you give them a different little paint job and it's a new figure all of a sudden mm-hmm. but imagine they're like here's um here's spider-man versus sandman for some reason <laughs> we don't know why we just uh, you know we just wanted to use an old toy oh um uh, here's spider-man versus the rhino from amazing spider-man 2 isn't that Why weird? Does he look like Paul Giamatti? Uh, I don't know. Do you like Paul Giamatti? His face sells toys. Look, I can't wait to go to like a dollar store and they're selling like the knockoff version, Spooderman versus like Abomination or something. I don't want to talk about this. I hate that. <laughs> uh, so instead, let's let's let you guys sound off. Uh, we have a few YouTube comments to get through. Uh, so we'll, um, we'll bounce between these. Kel, why don't you start us off? Okay. Um, the first one is from the ultra mega number four of you, Omega underscore Jericho. And the E in Jericho is a three. So you know, this guy's a, he's a, a user <laughs> hacked what? into the network. Uh, okay. That's what the kids say. Uh huh. Is what I'm told. Yep. Uh, Omega says, the Ultra Mega takes are so odd. If the story branches toward the return of Ultra Mega, then that sets up the Kaiju being big again. So that's where more battles would come in play. I don't see how nothing was even taken from the dialogue. I don't know what that last sentence means, if I'm being honest. I don't see how nothing was ever taken, even taken from the dialogue. What they're saying is, why is it that you guys didn't get that from the Uh, dialogue? I see. Yeah, I don't. I'm immune from this. I don't read. I mean, I read the book, but I don't understand it, so I don't even have thoughts about that. But. Again, I don't remember anything that I say ever. So, huh? oh, nice um, deflection. I, I mean, listen, it's not a deflection if it's the truth. Um, so, thanks for listening to the review. Yeah, don't <laughs> worry, Omega Jericho. I'm on your side. Don't worry. Uh, listen, I am too. Ultra Mega fucking rules. Um, Screw all y'all. I think that's funny. Like the person is saying that the takes are odd, but you guys like it. Only <laughs> praise Ultra yeah. Mega. Yeah, that's the I only know. part that's odd to me. I don't. I don't get that. Yeah. Um, Phil, why don't you go next? Okay, this is a YouTube comment on our Way of X number three review from Harris, longtime listener and writer of writing in of the show. He says, "Damn it! Now I have to pick up Way of X. Good review and discussion about the ramifications." True. Thanks for writing in, Harris. That was the most recent Way of X. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, that was a big discussion. Yeah, yeah, we had a huge discussion about that. Um, I think, yeah, I think, uh, Harris, that you would probably enjoy that book. Um, I want to say you're a Nightcrawler guy. Um, I don't feel like we talked X-Men too much, but uh, it's a it's a solid series. I think it's up your alley, and I think that, you know, given what we know about Onslaught, uh, it's going to get more and more interesting as we go forward. So what's up? I think someone's in my house. Give me just a second. 
That's a weird situation. Uh, do you think Kale has like a Liam Neeson taken like situation going on right now? I don't know. It's really cryptic. I think someone's in my house. Because he's alone there, I think. Is he? I mean, oh yeah, he had to take Jess and uh, I don't know about his dog, but he had to take Jess somewhere, right? Mm hmm. Damn. This was a graphic that USA Today had 10 years ago about the weather. Yeah, I've seen that. It's Kale, what funny. happened? I think somebody must be doing something next door outside because the bathroom window is open. So I think that's probably what I was hearing. Oh, okay. You thought they were inside your house? Well, I could hear it, but I didn't know the window was open. Okay. It sounded like it was coming from like downstairs. Gotcha. Wow, that's creepy. Yeah. Yeah. All right, um, we'll just move on to the next comment. Give me one second. I'm just making a note for Marco. 22 minutes. And Pete. Oh, yeah, good call. Okay. All right. So this next one comes from Nehemiah, Nehemiah Cisneros. That's Cisneros? A, that's a, Cisneros. Nehemiah Cisneros, who says, get into Gunslinger reviews when it comes out. Of course, that's a comment about Spawn. Um, yeah, listen, I bought Spawn 319 this week. Ooh. I am down. Um, I'm feeling Spawn. I've never been a reader of the Spawn comics before, but that last issue, the Spawn Universe one, made me want to read them. Um, and I'm actually really excited for the Gunslinger. I, that's the cover I bought for Spawn Universe. Um I, I, I'm I'm very very ready to see what's next. Yeah, All people right. seem to really want us to read Spawn. It's sick, dude. Listen, <laughs> our review of Spawn's universe, the review that <clears throat> was botched, uh, that 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 one did numbers, man. That thing has six hundred views. Yeah, and like it was Pete, Marco, and I. None of us like, like Pete had some familiarity no, with no no he didn't yeah y'all y'all really fucked that up <laughs> i have zero background on spawn yeah we know <laughs> we heard yep you you and marco not knowing about spawn is one thing because you don't you're not exposed yeah but pete listen pete watched the movie he saw the movie he saw the same movie i saw he got every detail wrong. <laughs> every single one. That's funny. Yeah, he, and he saw it like 15 years ago. Listen, I understand that, okay? Yeah. Everybody's memory is not the best. Mm -hmm. I'm not defending him. Fuck Pete. He messed that up. <laughs> I just... I, mm, man, I just, you know... I see those five downvotes, and I go, man... Would that have happened if I were there? Probably, but well, I don't think so because I liked it. I would have been, I would have been saying, "No, you're wrong." Mm. I would have said everything that the comments said, and Pete would have had to say, "You know what, Sean? You're absolutely right about as he, everything." As he so often does. Moving right along. <laughs> uh, Kale, take the next one. Uh, this is from episode 243 from Snake of Talons. All of you, oh, this is our, our Hellfire Gala um, episode. All of your outfits were fucking fire. Everyone looks great and happy birthday to Sean. Thanks. Have to give the best dress to Phil. Thank you. I'll react to that in just a second. <laughs> Loved everything about his outfit with Pete being a close second. All right. Snake, what the fuck? <laughs> do you know the effort that i went in like pete was a sec he didn't even wear a shirt are you okay with being second to me though kale you at least put effort into it okay even even makeup alone you put effort into it like yep. <laughs> hey, snake what the fuck 
You're going to do me like that? I thought we were boys. I was very pleased with how my uh, my my walkway outfit turned out, so to speak. I think I was ready for, you know, a real high fashion type of gala, so to speak. It, yeah, my man, you did good. I got stuck there for two weeks. All right. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, I'm with you, Kale. I, I voted for you based on effort. Um, I, I think that goes a long way and I think you took it the furthest, but Hey, everyone's entitled to their opinion. And the fact of the matter is that, you know, they did that for your entertainment. Um, and clearly you enjoyed it snake. So whoever you voted, voted for, we thank you for even checking it out. I don't. And I appreciate the uh, the birthday wishes. Mm. Phil, go for it. All right, this is a long one. No, this it's is, not. This is from Trent Stewart. <laughs> they write, never miss a show. I almost broke a sweat reading that one. Uh, thanks, Trent. We appreciate it. That was now, a mouthful. <laughs> do, you think, do you think that's um, a compliment or do you think that's a demand? <laughs> <laughs> he's like phil i know you weren't there the last two weeks never miss a show never miss a show <laughs> sorry Trent. <laughs> well i hope you enjoy the next three Month. weeks yeah that's right <laughs> <laughs> uh and then the last one we have for today is from william b who writes in and says hey pals i just wanted to share some exciting news with you guys I recently sold a story to Ahoy Comics that will appear in the back matter of their new series, Blacksmith, issue one. That's Blacksmith. I'm so excited and honored to have my short fiction selected. I'm a fan of The Wrong Earth, and I've been submitting prose short stories to Ahoy for over a year. You would need two hands to count how many times they've rejected me, but one finally hit. I've been writing for 10 years, and sometimes it's hard not to get jaded, but I feel like if you don't give up on your dream, it will happen, just maybe not in the way you expect. Now I have a copy of the comic framed in my room. Cynicism is easy. Optimism is a muscle you have to keep working. Love the podcast. Peace. That's a Man, beautiful message. Bravo. Be that fucking rules. That's yeah. amazing. Yeah. Um, we always talk on this show about you know, positivity and the need for positive messages within the industry. And I feel like one thing that we never talk about is that breakthrough moment, which, you know, like, this isn't like the, the biggest thing that's going to happen in your career, but mm. it's, a, it's maybe the most special moment because this is when you're being published, presumably for the first time with a publisher that you really enjoy, you genuinely like their work and you've been trying for over a year, that's such a beautiful accomplishment. And I'm so happy for you. Um, I think we should be celebrating moments like that far more than we do. And I definitely want to see your work. So I'll be picking up this book. I don't even know anyone else who's on the creative team for Blacksmith, but I know you. Yeah. And I will absolutely be picking up your book. Thank you for sharing that, my friend. It's a that watershed really moment, you know? Uh, this is momentous. You sh you framed it. You'll never forget this moment. Uh, and I I really appreciate the, the 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 thought about cynicism and optimism because cynicism is easy. It is very easy just to think negatively. The neg like the worst will happen no matter what you do. You were rejected ten times by Ahoy. The eleventh time it worked. I think that's a very inspiring message. And thank you so much for sharing that with us. Like mm -hmm. you yeah. definitely didn't need to do that, but damn. Yeah, that is that is amazing, man. I, I I I had a very visceral reaction when I first saw this message. This is so yeah. cool. Um, yeah, I wish you all the luck on the right Earth, hmm. or even Let's more luck on the wrong Earth. Yeah, well, you need it. You need it on the wrong Earth. Uh, let's get jump into the pals pulls here. Uh, we all picked the same books. <laughs> Um, oh, I have it. I ha I'm gonna pivot. Go ahead. Uh, Kyle Higgins has a new book out called Ordinary Gods. Uh, that we we got an advanced copy uh, a couple of weeks ago, and I just wanted to call that out because it comes out next week, and I wanted to see if Kyle Higgins is any good uh, with his non superhero stuff. Okay. 
and it's actually pretty good. Um, it's a, it's a story about um, it's basically sort of a reincarnation story. Mm. Um, there are sets of gods who are uh, who have been born and reborn through time, and now they're hunting each other. Hmm. Mm so that one can reign supreme uh, something to that effect um it's really really good the art's really good um the first <laughs> sean you're never gonna believe this it's the first issue mm-hmm. something happens really listen i was blown away <laughs> things <I'm shocked. laughs> things move is what i'm saying yeah hmm. i don't i don't know uh, listen hey I understand. Remember what Bilbo said. Cynicism is easy. Who's Bilbo? William B. Oh, my God. I'm sorry, William B. Do they go by Bilbo? I don't know. Oh, okay. no. His, name, his name's William B. Bill B. Bo. Bo. Uh, anyway, Ordinary Gods. I think it's worth it. Kyle Higgins, give it a shot. All right. Well, um... You sold me. I I like Kyle Higgins. Like Kyle Higgins was part of the draw for the initial Power Rangers. Mm-hmm. I knew just mm-hmm. enough about him to know. All right, okay, they got they got someone good. Um, and with Radiant Black, hey, he at this point he's Kyle Higgins. You yep. know, at this point he did Power Rangers and it went really well. Uh, that first run on on Power Rangers was high quality, um, and you know Radiant Black is doing what what it's doing, whatever it's doing. Uh, so yeah, I felt I felt very similar to the way we feel about Radiant Black with Ultraman. Um, you get the background sort of uh, uh, government, you know, conspiracy or whatever for the first three issues before Ultraman even shows up. Oh but my even, god. You don't even see Ultraman really do anything until issue five, which is the end of the first arc. Um, so, like to, to like I said, to to see things move and things happen was uh, really exciting. You know, I feel like so. Okay, so I gotta tie this somehow into Rob Liefeld. <laughs> okay, let's right. hear it. One of the things he talks about a lot is the way that comics in the 80s and 90s and, you know, 70s, whatever, were more exciting. And I feel like if you made a comic book like that, and and by the way, you could chew me out if I'm wrong. I very well may be. But I feel like if you made a comic like that in which the title hero doesn't even, like, do anything for five issues, it just would have been canceled. Like it just wouldn't, it wouldn't, they wouldn't have even let it out back then. Like it wouldn't have happened. Unless it was like a vertigo book. But the difference, I think, is so when we talk about Kyle Higgins spending so much time on and providing all this backstory and exposition, you wouldn't even see that in a vertigo book because, uh, that's like a rookie writer mistake to spend all this time trying to flesh out the background and stuff. Like that's, I think traditionally you take a book like Sandman or something and it's unfair to compare Kyle Higgins to like a gold standard of like comic books or whatever but other vertigo books of like the 80s or whatever they would they would space that out over a run spoon feed it to you slowly not give it all at once I'm with you and I, I, there's nothing wrong with exposition there's nothing wrong with fleshing your characters out you got to do it I just feel like there's a way to do that and still keep your story exciting. Yeah. And it very much feels like the trade, the, the trade mentality is yeah. almost like the, yep. the movification of comics because they, it always, it, like you, you see that type of thing all the time in the first like 40 minutes of a movie. And it's fine. Cause you're going to get the whole story right here um, in the one sitting. But when you, pay for a comic like the trade for let's say ultraman Uh, it's ultraman right yeah yeah the trade for ultraman will probably cost more than my ticket to see black widow will it uh you're going to new york city yeah 
15 bucks? Well, 16 bucks? I don't know. Yeah. Um, I mean, I already bought the ticket, so I, I happen to know. Seven, it was $17. Whew. Yeah, and I pay for black. Don't rub it in, okay? You got out. <laughs> you got out. I'm still here. <laughs> Anyway, I, I um, think you're right, Bill. I think it's it speaks to like the um, the 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 television season mentality of like you can yeah. have this slow build and have things, you know, boiling or simmering around the thing you want to happen, mm-hmm. um, because you're working for the trade. But you know, if you're buying by the by the issue, like that's not really exciting. Yeah, I I feel like it likens more to like. You're writing these books to be picked up by Netflix so that you can have like an eight hour binge experience because with traditional television, you know, it's like reading a single issue comic. You get one episode or one issue and it comes out once a week or something, once a month, whatever. You know, but with like the Netflix style of television, it drops eight hours all at once, just like a trade would. And you with with Netflix, especially, you'll notice their television programming, like having the first three episodes just be real slow burns. But, you know, you can watch five more hours to get everything at once same thing with the trade i'm not gonna go out of my way to disagree with that but i will say this is not a this is not a a new thing Mm -hmm. um comics have been built around trades since the 2000s yeah um before netflix and comic book some comic book writers really 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 want to write other things Mm -hmm. um and I think it's been a lot of that, plus the fact that, you know, there was a desire to penetrate the trade market, the book market, um, and re- redesigning the way that we think about collected editions that led to what we're in now. You know, look at Ultimate Spider-Man and how that was collected. It was six ish, five to six issues every time. And it was the story, you know, yeah. Um, and I mean, it worked. It worked for me. I bought every single one of them damn trades. But, uh, you know, I just, I feel like sometimes it gets taken a little too far. Uh, but on to the polls. Uh, so Phil and I chose X-Men number one. This is, of course, what we've all been waiting for. Yeah. <laughs> oh, bless you. Thank you. Talk about it, Phil. Yeah. Yeah. Um... So X-Men number one, we've been waiting for this. We talked about X-Men 17 and the Jonathan Hickman, Dawn of X era, how it felt like meat and potatoes X-Men. We're going back to the early 90s, Jim Lee era X-Men. That's what that single issue felt like. I wonder if that's what this run by Jerry Duggan and uh, Pepe Larraz and Marta Gracia is going to be like. Uh, We voted on their final team member. It's Polaris. Um... I voted for Polaris. Yeah, I voted for myself. Um, that clearly didn't work out. I think I voted for Dazzler. Um, when we look at the art, it looks beautiful as expected. We got a lot of classic X Men here. You, know, you see Rogue, you see uh, you see X twenty three Wolverine, Cyclops, Jean, Polaris. Uh, it looks exciting. I'm a little and there's, they're fighting dinosaurs in some of the art on the cover. Do like it when the X-Men fight dinosaurs. Can't That's go fun. wrong with that. Yep. Can't go wrong with that. I'm a little worried that going back to meat and potatoes X-Men, though, this is just a meat, a mild trepidation I have, is going to go back to feeling like the last 15 years or so of stagnant X-Men books, though. So mm. we'll see. And I'm, I'm, I'm lukewarm on Jerry Duggan, generally speaking. Okay, uh, so my feeling is that they they can't really go back. Like, because of the fact that, like, okay, the only reason X-Men comics were like that is because of who owned the rights to the movies. Right. That, that's it. That's the only reason. Mm-hmm. So there wouldn't even be, like, an impetus to go back to that type of storytelling at this point. You know, but they were still pretty dull after Grant Morrison left the title. And that's, you know, they were still owned by Fox, obviously. But this is before, like, the Marvel Studio stuff kicked in the high gear. So, like, I'm talking, like, 2004 to 2008 X-Men. And that's still, you know, you, you had uh, Joss Whedon on Astonishing. But, like, Uncanny was still pretty dull. Well, uh, 
I, I'm worried the Krakoa stuff's going to be a backdrop thing that doesn't really, that isn't really of much consequence in this title. I, I hope it's really good. I'm going to read it. I'm excited to read it. You know, the art team is fantastic. There's just a little trepidation that it's going to be um, uninspired. Well, they teased, I think it was for issue three, that they'll be going, um, they'll be going and dealing with the high evolutionary, which is a big deal. Um, of course, the high evolutionary is the person who genetically engineered uh, Scarlet Witch and Quicksilver. That's right. Yeah, mm. that's the new that's the new continuity uh, truth about those characters. Um, I'm into that. Sure. How do you feel about this title now? Are you excited for it in general? Or where, where are you at? Oh yeah, I, I'm really excited for it. Um, Jerry Duggan is, is is good. I think that Marauders does Marauders should have ended a long time ago. Or been more condensed or something. Yeah, I, I just feel like it, it it floated, it coasted on a concept. Yeah. Rather than having like a full fledged identity that was more focused and that was the biggest issue with it but the the scripting for the most part was pretty good like when he's in his own lane when he's not you know planet size we talked about how it felt like he was kind of trying to do the, the hickman thing yeah. when he's doing his own thing his own voice i i enjoy that i think it's quite good so um i'm definitely excited to see what he has to say with these characters, I'm wondering where the heat is on the mm -hmm. team. Mm -hmm. But we'll, you know, that remains to be seen. Yeah, th we'll see how that plays out. Obviously, I mean, we got a lot of the classic characters here. Uh, we'll see how they play together. Yeah. Uh, so that's next week. We'll have a review for that, of course. Another book we will absolutely have a review for is uh, "Nice House on the Lake," number two. Ah, uh, hell yeah. Uh, this is horror done right so far. Um, we, uh, we're invited to a nice house on a lake and the world ends. Um, real excited to see where this book goes, um, how these characters will interact, uh, what James Sinian, uh, is trying to pull off here with all these characters uh because if you if you read the first issue there there are a, a ton of um um captions with little in information bits about each one and each each character has their own little symbol um just really he's really working on something great here and i'm uh, really excited to see how he pulls it off yeah this was I mean, this was one of my favorite single issues uh, of the entire year so far. Yep. Uh, it was really, really special. We, you know, we talk a lot about how hard it is to do a number one that's really good with the perfect setup. You know, if you're doing like Iron Man, for example, you have a character in your hands who is established over, you know, 60 years or 50 years or whatever and you have all this continuity to draw from you have the fact that most people reading the comic already know who iron man is so so much of the legwork has been done by creators before you so and and, and people still falter right like it's that's how hard it is james tinian uh and the rest of the crew did something really special in that they established a whole swath of new characters and a concept in the one issue and they left us salivating for more. So I'm super hyped. I think it's going to be really good. And um, I really hope that this book takes off and, and, and like has legs beyond just like one arc. Big, big props to James Tinian in general too. Like, I feel like for, you know, for years, he was just like a team player guy, you know, a staple person that would get things done, fill in the patches and stuff. This last year, year and a half, two years, J James Tinian's gotten his due and he's had his opportunities. And I don't want to attribute this solely to what I'm about to say, but it's got to be in some way, shape or form related. Uh, you know, given the downsizing of DC, 
and how they've deprioritized paying big money contracts to, you know, the tippy top writers, it does open doors. And a guy like James Tinney has been paying his dues for over 10 years, like you said, but um, you know, that DC's not as top heavy as it mm-hmm. used to be from a writer perspective. And he's, he's, you know, working his way to the top. And that's great. He's on Batman indefinitely now, whereas last year there were question marks about how long his run was going to last. We thought John Ridley was going to take over. Um, And then now Nice House, and that's not even to say anything about the great creator-owned stuff he's done, like something's killing the children. This dude's on fire. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, hats off to him. Speaking of Grant Morrison... Did we mention Grant Morrison? We did. <laughs> we, were, we did earlier. We were talking about their X-Men run. Oh. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Speaking of Grant Morrison, uh, they are going to be saying goodbye to DC Comics here real soon. Again. Again. So right now, um, we, we've witnessed the end of uh, the Green Lantern that, that uh, they were doing with Liam Sharp. Um, but we know that Superman and the Authority is due out. This is not actually supposed to be Grant's swan song at DC. Um, this was actually written and put together in 2018, so well before Green Lantern's end. But due to all various kinds of things, Superman and the Authority is actually coming out after Green Lantern. And this is going to serve uh, as Grant's goodbye. Um, they say that they put their goodbye in Green Lantern. So if you want to check that out, you know, check out season two. Um, but these are, these are, this is what they had to say. Uh, Green Lantern is kind of me saying goodbye. And then I'm sorry I've hung around for so long. <laughs> Both the Green Lantern and Wonder Woman Earth 1 Volume 3 mark a milestone for me because after this, I'll be taking some time off for quite a while. I'm kind of stunned with what we did on the Green Lantern. It was a big endeavor for me and Liam Sharp. Again, I'm so lucky to have worked with someone as brilliant as Liam in the same way that I feel lucky that I worked with Yannick. I've been doing a lot of work in television, so one of the things that I'm looking at now are novels to adapt or stuff like that. That's kind of like doing a comic because you're trying to understand why someone initially came up with the idea. You know, what was their motivation? What was their way of thinking? And how do you bring that into the future? And that's what we do in comics. So I, I, uh, you know, I love Grant. I really, 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 really do. Their creator own slash like, non-DC work over the last decade has not spoken to me. Hmm. Let's see. When when did We 3 come out? Jeez. I, that I, old? Yeah, that's Maybe. pretty old. Uh, yeah, you might be right. Uh, I, they did 18 Days. That was meh. I did not like that. Yeah. Happy? Was that in the last 10 years? That was okay. I don't, I don't know if it was, I don't recall, but it's more, more recent run of his creator own. And I didn't really, it was all right. It was all yeah, right. That's fine. Uh, it, we th- your points well taken. We three was uh 2004. Whew, okay. Yeah, that's all true. Um, and honestly, when you think about it, I mean, Grant Morrison has done like everything there is to do at DC comics. They've, on the obscure stuff like Animal Man and Doom Patrol, their own creator on uh, Vertigo stuff with uh, Invisibles, which, you know, uh, maybe a magnum opus. They've done iconic stuff with Superman, whether it's All Star or Action Comics. You know, so much on Batman, so much. Their long run on Batman, our, uh, Serious House on Serious Earth, Gothic. Uh, they did Justice League, they did One Roman Earth One. They did their Green Lantern book. They did the. They and Mark Millar had stuff on the Flash. Uh, they did Final Crisis and Multiversity and DC One Million, which is all just like you know waxing philosophically about DC Universe and comics in general. 
you know, if you look at the Justice League, like that, those characters I mentioned, they're the big five: Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman, Green Lantern, Flash. I mean, what is what is there left to do for Grant at this point? They literally did everything. Ambush DC. Bug. What's that? Ambush bug. Ambush bug. Where's the ambush bug? I mean, but what's he going to do with ambush bug that he didn't do with uh, Animal Man? Blue Beetle. I mean, he did it with Batman. And well, they did. I'm thinking of like uh, the, the one issue of Multiversity where they go through the Charlton Comics characters. Yeah. Good question. Also, in that one, yeah, uh, uh, Pax Americana is the issue. All right, I'm out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's the thing. Is The thing we always talk about, Sean, is uh, all the Marvel stuff that could have been done. That's the shame of this. Uh, the shame of it is that Grant will probably never work for Marvel again. Uh, it, it appears... I mean, I don't know. Maybe that's not fair to say. Maybe they really just got caught up with DC because they love it so much. I could definitely see that, but it feels like there is a distaste for Marvel after what happened with New X Men. And granted, that was, you know, what almost twenty years ago at this point. Yeah, uh, we're we're getting close to that, but they haven't worked there again. Three editor in chiefs ago, or something, too. Yeah, at so. least. Um, it also so. just doesn't seem like their style. Marvel? Yeah. I mean, New X-Men is, yeah, you know, I would say, got to be like the best X-Men run ever next to the classic Claremont stuff, right? Right. But that's probably as close as like Grant Morrison as you can get really at Marvel, right? Marvel, Mar- what is it? Marvel Boy? They did Marvel this Boy. They other, did, yeah. Uh, was it Fantastic One, Two, Three, Four? Was another thing they did there? Hmm. Uh, I mean, Fantastic Four, if anything, feels like the most Grant Morrison Marvel thing, right? I think, yeah. I think that there's a lot that could be done with the Fantastic Four. I really want to see Grant Morrison's Avengers. Yeah. I mean, I think they would do a lot with Captain America. Yeah, that, that's I think a, they do a lot with Iron Man. Yeah. A person who envisions the future that is to come and has to create the technology that will exist in it that we'll need at the time. I think that's a, that is a perfect Grant Morrison uh, uh, title. Yeah. Can't you picture like a Grant Morrison, Iron Man, the sixties that like sees the future of 2010, but has to find a way to get us there. Yeah. That that's amazing. I would love to read that. But it doesn't, I mean, Grant's in their sixties. It seems like it's never to be. Um, I really liked what I read of Green Lantern season one. I haven't read season two. I read all of season one. Uh, now that it's wrapping up, I'll, I'll go back and read the whole thing. Um, I'm sure, I mean, Liam Sharp's art is beautiful. And I'm very excited for Superman, the authority. I'm really intrigued by that book, but I mean, I mean, if there was any book that felt like their, their swan song, it was multiversity, her most recent book club. Agreed. Uh, although it's funny that, that that you know that came out a few years ago now. It's but, like six uh, years ago, yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, definitely will be reading Superman and the Authority. Uh, if this is Grant's swan song with superhero comics, uh, at least as it relates to the big two, um, I definitely want to be there for that. Mm-hmm. They say that they'll be gone for quite a while. Um, who knows what that means? Grant mm-hmm. can get swept up in Hollywood and or whatever and just be gone. Um, but it's just it's kind of sad to me the idea that they're just going to languish in, you know, re adapting novels. That uh, yeah, I feel like you know it's not the not the greatest use of their time. I don't think so either. I mean, Grant's whole thing is like taking classics and and doing something with them, right? You know, like. Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman, like three, the three biggest yeah, yeah. tent poles of comic books and finding something creative to do with them. When you think of like adapting novels, like every classic novel on earth has been adapted and something's been done with it, right? So I can't imagine they're going through like the works of Shakespeare or like, like Ernest Hemingway's bibliography or something. Like they must be like doing what every Hollywood producer type person does and looking for some popular novel to like, like the same thing we see with comics being published these days where it's like studios are desperate and hungry for new stuff to do something with. 
that feels like what Grant's doing with her time, I imagine. And you're right. That's that's kind of a bummer. I don't yep. know. I think you guys aren't giving novels enough credit. <laughs> no, 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 no. There's nothing wrong with novels at all. I love novels. I'm simply saying that I want to see Grant's I, I want to see Grant's ideas for you know, not, okay, so obviously superheroes are not new, but um, Grant is taking characters that exist and being able to do new things with them versus the idea of creating an adaptation of a novel. Yeah. Typically, that's going to look like the novel in comic book form. Um, and that I could do without. Other people can do that kind of thing, too. It doesn't feel like a Grant Moore. I think it's special about Grant Morrison is the things Grant Morrison does that no one else can or will do. You know what I mean? Grant does all these unique things that are completely unique to Grant Morrison and all the things that they put out. And if they're being limited to just adapting novels to movies or television, like I said, it feels like a thing that like pretty much any television producer can do. I, I mean, but you're, <laughs> it, it sounds like you're underestimating what Grant can do. Well, it depends what they're allowed to do. I, I feel like it's even more. There's more con- like restraints with with that than there is with comic books. At least For Grant, Grant Morrison. What TV like company or executive really gives that much who, of a shit about I mean, Grant Morrison? Who says he's gonna do it for TV or movies? I mean, we saw what happened with Jeff Johns as an executive at Warner Brothers. I mean, how much say do they truly have? I'm just saying. I think I think you're underestimating Grant. I think he's got some. Uh, yeah. he, they have some cool stuff, probably that they're working on, and whatever they do, will have the Grant touch. You know what okay. I mean? Um, I like I'm reminded of um, um, Odyssey from uh, Matt Fraction and Christian Ward. Um, is a retelling of the Iliad and the Odyssey but gender bent and set in space. That's pretty cool. Hmm. Do that with a comic book. It is, but, you know, conversely, we have Proctor Valley Road, which was made very obviously to be adapted. And in my opinion, that was not good. And um, 18 Days, which I really did not enjoy. Hmm. Well, at the very least, like Proctor Valley Road, what didn't feel like Grant Morrison? You know what I mean? No, no. that felt like he wasn't the. Jeez, oh, they weren't the only writer yeah. on the book. To be fair, but it very much was like, whoa, this feels like this feels like looking at Grant Morrison through the lens of like a corporate suit. Yeah, yeah. like it, it just it was just weird, and I, I don't want to see more things like that from them. But you might be right, Kale. For me, for me, that example feels like the that uh, that book we reviewed, Compass. I think it was called. Yeah, yeah. It was Greg Rucka presents, and it, it kind of for what one, one of our main things was like it. It doesn't feel like a Greg Rucka book. It it's by it feels like he liked this book, and he knew the only way it was going to sell was if he put his name on it somewhere. Well, that's literally true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I'm saying. For Proctor Valley Road, that's sort of what that feels like and sounds like to me. I mean, yeah, it it felt like they delegated a title, right? It'd be like if I, far be it for me to compare myself to Grant Morrison, it'd be like if I came up with an idea, told someone to go write it, and then I like read it afterwards and said, yeah, okay. Nah, you can feel the Grant Morrison in the book. Like in the ideas, I think. You, you, you can feel the you can feel aspects of Grant Morrison even in the writing. It's just like Grant Morrison light. I think we used that exact phrase to describe it at the time. It it, it just is it's weird. And eighteen days was weird. So if he if they're gonna write these books themselves, okay, fine, we'll see. But if the idea is just to get these things adapted to make them into movies or whatever, I could do without that. I'm good on that. Mm-hmm but we got to move on. Um, We will absolutely be reading whatever Grant puts out, uh, especially Superman and the authority. And then whatever announcements come in the future, we love Grant. 
don't take this conversation to mean anything other than that because I am a massive fan of Grant. We got the shrines. Exactly. <clears throat> so uh, sticking on the DC end of things, Batgirl is going to be returning to her costume. Uh, Barbara Gordon, that is, will be returning to her costume for the Fear State crossover that's coming to the Batman line of titles. Um, we got to see some new costumes, not only for Barbara, but for Stephanie and Cassandra that were developed by Bruno Redondo, who's the artist on uh, Nightwing. Um, and we'll be seeing those costumes utilized in the uh, upcoming issues of Nightwing uh, that he does with Tom Taylor. So a lot of people are really mad about this. What? Really, really, really mad. I feel like Batgirl is a lightning rod for like anger. <laughs> yeah. Now, Batgirl was obviously paralyzed by uh, the Joker in the Killing Joke and has been Oracle for a really long time. Um, then she was an Oracle. Then uh, during the New 52, she was pulled out of the chair by Gail Simone and restored through an implant in her back. And what followed was a really, really knockout run. Like that, that Gail Simone Batgirl was amazing. Mm. Pissed off a lot of people. Uh, people who identified with Barbara for being wheelchair bound um, felt betrayed by the fact that now this character was not their character. So then Batgirl, uh, Barbara rather, elected to go back to the wheelchair more recently um, because the, she was putting too much strain on the implant. And so she wanted to take it easy and return to the chair. Kelly, you're looking at me funny. She went back to the wheelchair or just the chair? The, well, she the retired, chair. She retired from uh, being Batgirl, and I'm pretty sure she's been operating in a wheelchair. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, I could be wrong, but I'm 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 behind on, on all that stuff. Uh, but I'm 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 explaining why people are are angry at the moment about Batgirl. So if I'm getting something wrong, uh, then I'm sorry. But I I think what I'm saying is correct. I think you're right. That sounds correct. So <laughs> no, that that sounds Phil like the fucking timeline. Knows. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely. That sounds like the timeline. So uh, she chose to retire the Batgirl costume to not put strain on her implant. But now, the, oh, before I say this, the implication that I got at the time was not that she would never be Batgirl again. It was that she would only be Batgirl when it really mattered. She felt like she yeah. could do a lot of good from the Oracle perspective. Yeah, that was the vibe and, I got too. Yeah, Right. And she has been. She's a, she's a prominent figure in uh nightwing in batman um she's really doing a great job in that in that role she's even a, a prominent figure in um the joker book for for uh, her dad but for fear state she's going to be putting the costume back on and mm -hmm. people are livid because again they feel like she is an ableist character she's a character who uh presents as you know um wheelchair bound paralyzed uh, but then you know whenever she feels like it she's not right and so that upset mm -hmm. a lot of people mm -hmm. this is like a really this is one of those types of things that like uh, very much divides people that are really sensitive to wanting to see more diverse representation in comic books like there's a lot of infighting i think because on the one hand you have people that say we need more uh, you know characters that are disabled uh prominent characters that are disabled and stuff and they they like that barbara worked through her trauma of everything that happened in the killing joke and you know oracle to me is a great i, I always like barbara as oracle uh, maybe that's because I grew up reading that version of the character or whatever. Mm -hmm. But then there are people who argue against that, saying that like the thing that happened in the killing joke was inexcusable. That book should be burned forever. And like um, they don't even, they like reject that that kind of thing even happened to Barbara. And 
like the like the idea of her being Batgirl is like a positive retcon or whatever on this grisly thing that happened in comic book history or whatever that was um, a, a slant towards women characters. Um, and and you're right, you get these people who want like they think um, Barbara should never return from the chair. To me, I think it's fine that she leaves the chair to fight at when it needs to, but it's not for me. This book isn't like this, this, this isn't my crusade, I guess, you know? Well, one of the other things that a lot of uh, Barbara fans say is that the chair being, uh, her being uh, paralyzed and, and becoming Oracle is a redemption of the killing joke because mm, yeah. it gave her new life. Now she wasn't just another costumed hero now she had a unique role and it was the only good thing to come out of that book yeah no matter where you fall on that spectrum the reality is there are two kinds of fans of batgirl and one or the other will always be disappointed when she's doing you know the thing that they don't want her to do and for me i feel like either way it's kind of selfish yeah. Like yeah. the character ultimately isn't yours. And um, she clearly exists in two worlds and DC set it up that way. You know, um, I personally don't want stories of her costume adventures to go away permanently. I, I, I think that there's a lot of meat left on that bone. I think the idea that the daughter of Jim Gordon is a hero in her own right and a powerful figure in Gotham is important. I think that's the, the, the fact that she, she physically takes up um, the fight against crime in Gotham. I think that's really relevant. And I also think it's relevant that she performs the role of Oracle. In my opinion, I don't think that the best thing about Barbara as a character is either that she's Batgirl or that she's Oracle, I think it's that she's Barbara. And you have to accept the totality of that, which is not just her in a wheelchair. That said, I mean, Oracle really is very unique in comic books. You have this vast Bat family, and you have, oftentimes when the Batgirl topic comes up, you have people who are happy that Barbara isn't Batgirl because, you know, the Cassandra Kane or Stephanie Brown fans, and they want to see those characters in the spotlight. And they feel like if Barbara is the one wearing the Batgirl outfit that she takes away from their, their spotlight, mm -hmm. same thing kind of happens with Robins. Like you hear Tim Drake fans complain all the time. If like Damien is Robin or whatever, like it, people have very strong opinions about the characters that they stand for. But the thing about Oracle is I don't, I really can't think of another character in comics that serves in her kind of function. You know, you think of something like uh, Batman R.I.P. or something where Oracle is a central figure in, in like Batman's operations. She's never going to like usurp Batman as like the most popular character or whatever, but like as Oracle, she does something that literally no one else in comics does. I think that's very fair. Yeah the calculator this, I, I if i was a writer or an artist i don't think i'd ever want to work on a back row book because it well like the if, hell let me rephrase if i was like a really <laughs> successful one I, I would be there too many uh, i wouldn't be able to please everyone okay uh yeah well tom taylor is getting blasted on social media for this even though He's not the one who um, made the decision to take her out of the chair in the first place. That was Gail Simone. And um, it's just kind of weird that like people are choosing to attack him for this story now. Like it is what it is. It's just the most recent one. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, no. And by the way, didn't see this type of reaction to Batgirl um, at Burnside or whatever. It when was that there. Was coming out. Yeah, it was, it was there. there. Okay. Yeah, it was yeah. There. I, I remember there being backlash. I don't remember it being to this degree, but yeah. I, I think yeah, as I recall, the overwhelming sentiment was that she was going to reclaim her Batgirl identity for herself, 
you know, apart from Batman and and yeah. the Bat family, and I think that was overall celebrated. But I mean, the 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 naysayers were still just as loud. Yeah. Well, I guess that I guess that'll never go away. Um, to briefly address the new costume, I think it looks cool. Uh, it's it's like an evolution of the Burnside costume, kind of. Um, yeah, I can't. I really fucking like the the Bat Family costumes right now. I'm just going mm-hmm. through these covers that are on the uh, the games radar. I think Tim Drake looks fucking fire. Not even the blue stripes on uh, Nightwing's boots look just so good. Um, the thing about the Batgirl costume that I think is really really unique um, that I I mean I would think w- would be enough of a um give and take i guess mm-hmm. is that she's got a uh a, a, a reinforced like back brace um i guess it's in the jacket it may be just you know sort of outside uh, you know it's behind the cape so it's something we'll never ever see but it's addressed in the 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 costume schematics um, i bet it comes up in like the story or something in like a panel or two yeah yeah um, it, it, so, you know, it's not like Tom Taylor didn't think about these things, you know, mm. it's, it's literally giving her a way to do it and still acknowledge, you know, her, her disability. And, yeah. And not for nothing. It speaks to her ability to overcome a, tra- a traumatic event too. You know, there are people that are not permanently paralyzed, but, you know, they're told something like, you know, they'll never be able to walk again or something, and they rehab it, and they overcome this extreme obstacle. Um, her cowl very much reminds me of, like, uh, the Batwoman cowl from, like, 2007. Mm, the way yeah. it kind of covers up, and she's got, like, the white eyes here. Uh, I also like her... Her, her cape that extends into wings kind of looks very like Batman Beyond esque. Yeah. Uh, cool, cool kind of look here. I, yeah, I think it's a great suit. Yeah. Let's let's move on. Let's talk about uh, Amazing Spider Man real quick. I wanted to follow up on the story that we did from last week, where we learned the the writer portion of the creative team and we were questioning well who are the artists going to be marvel has um put that information out there um so patrick gleason who we talked about uh as a writer last week is also going to be an artist on the series um so he'll be doing both um but he'll be joined by sarah pacelli who of course create uh, co-created miles morales and to lesser celebration was the artist on the um the uh jj abrams and child spider-man story which J. by J. the way child if i recall correctly she, her name vanished from the credits of that book at Oof. Oof. did it if i if i remember correctly yeah brutal um wow and uh michael dowling will also be a part of it and then a big selling point for a lot of people is that uh, Arthur Adams is going to be doing every single cover. Very cool. I love when stuff like that happens. Like the one listed here for Amazing Spider-Man 75, really cool cover. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I saw some sentiment that people were tired of seeing Sarah Pacelli draw Spider-Man. I could watch Sarah. I could see Sarah Pacelli do literally anything i don't care who what she does as long as she's doing it i'm That's, with you yeah i don't i guess people want to see a make like a change up but whatever no she's great yeah do whatever she wants if she wants to do spider-man let her fucking do spider-man yeah yeah i mean i, I mean i will say um it feels like she's typecast a little bit yeah maybe um, pigeonholed but yeah but i don't think that seeing her do what she's good at doing one of the many things she's good at doing from an artistic perspective is bad um i uh, frankly i wouldn't be mad if she got roped into the x-men fold Mm. i would i would like to see that yeah i think that would be really cool i think she fit right in with a lot of the stuff that's been happening in the dawn of x hickman era books i think that her style would fit in real nicely um 
Patrick Gleason art, by the way, he's a ter- he's a terrific artist. Man, his Spider Man stuff too is cool. Uh, I wasn't crazy about the Tomasi run on Superman, but the art was always beautiful by Gleason. Yeah. Writing and drawing here. I don't know if I've ever read, read a Patrick Gleason written book. I can't think of any off the top of my head, at least. I think he did some of that Superman did he? stuff. Yeah, mm. I think so. Well, I'm into it. It's pretty cool. Yeah. I don't have anything really to say. Um, these artists are obviously talented. I'm still very much on the fence about this whole thing, what, yeah. whatever they're doing. Um, are we going to review that? Sure. Um, I think we should. I think we should review the first one. Gross. Just to see what, you know, see what it's about. You've got a long time to uh, prepare your body for this because it's not out. Oh, okay. Oh, well, thank God. October? That'll come sooner than you think. <laughs> In right. all my years, I've never it, had an October come when I expected it. I will say it is really interesting that they're handing the keys of their most popular character to someone that's going to be for the large part writing and illustrating it themselves. And it's not like, cause Gleason's doing both writing and or plus he's got help from like Sarah Pacelli, right? My, my man, do you even listen to this show? <laughs> Am I backwards on that? There are I mean, five, there are five writers on Spider-Man on this era of Spider-Man that are coming. Okay. But I meant yeah. this title, right? The well, the 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 head writer is Zeb Wells. Okay, all right. This yeah. is this is the title. Okay, yeah. It's gonna come um, out three times a month. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, <laughs> we'll see how it turns all right. out. All right. I, I didn't realize that you had no clue what we were talking. About. <laughs> yeah, I misunderstood. <laughs> how? I thought you, I, I, my interpretation of what you said was like Gleason would be writing and illustrating Amazing Spider Man with help from like Sarah Pacelli and stuff. Because you don't know what we talked about last week. Yep. <laughs> Do your job. Let's, let's talk about, let's talk about Black Widow. Black Widow is oh. coming out, if you can believe that, um, on the 9th. So oh, you might. It for me. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, well, I'll be seeing it on Thursday, okay? Which I'm is seeing 8th. it on Wednesday. Oh, screw you then. At 1 p.m. Nice. Um, suck the joy. Did you, see, did you hear how quick I quit laughing? I suck the yeah. joy right out of that conversation. I'm excited. It's been two years. It sure doesn't feel like it. It doesn't it feel is, like it's been two in years. In the other way. Oh, the bad yeah, way. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm with you on that. <laughs> Um, I can't wait to be back in a movie theater. I, I, I'm, this is not the most exciting movie ever by any stretch, but, um, it's Marvel and I need more, more Marvel in my life. Um, the reviews have been mixed positive, I would say so far. Um, Hmm. I did want to read just a couple of things, uh, review wise. Um, comicbook.com gave it a positive um, f- a review. Uh, Jamie Jarak said uh, Black Widow will be available to buy on Disney Plus, but if you have the chance to see it on the big screen, you should absolutely take it. The film will be the ideal return to the theater for any moviegoer, even those who are just casual fans of the MCU. While it's not hard to dwell on the fact that Black Widow should have been made a decade ago, the new movie still manages to be a well-placed addition to the franchise and the perfect send-off for Scarlett Johansson and Natasha Romanoff. Okay. Um, Variety said, Audiences going into Black Widow may still wonder what exactly they're going to get to see the title character do. In Scarlett Johansson's appearances in the MCU thus far, going back to Iron Man 2, she's been a kick-ass fighter in sleek leather with a few signature jackknife moves. I wondered or maybe feared that Black Widow would be two hours of that. It's not. It's much more interesting and absorbing. I'm really interested in what that could mean. Um, But then this this one is a a bit negative and it really has colored my, my opinion or my view going into the movie. 
Um, this comes from IndieWire. Uh, Eric Kong wrote this. He said, bad accents abound and no amount of fun can salvage the third act cliche of a giant burning object falling from the sky. But overall, Black Widow amounts to a satisfying addition to the Bourne Identity franchise. Oof. Mm. <laughs> That's so disrespectful. Yeah. <laughs> Probably Oof. accurate. That's pretty rough. Uh, are you guys excited? Nope. It's funny. We're coming two years into the first Marvel movie, right? Since uh, the last Spider-Man movie. And the first one we're getting is Black Widow. And like, obviously, there's nothing they could have done about that. This movie was shelled because of the pandemic. But I can't think of a less hype movie from for Marvel to come out of the pandemic with than this Black Widow movie. Because, I mean, the character died two and a half, three years ago, whatever it's been now. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm not particularly excited for this. It might be fine. I mean, every Marvel movie is is good at the like it, it you know it's at least a seven or something right out of ten there's no like outright bad marvel movies and i doubt this one will be bad either um i don't think it's a needle mover even when it drops on friday on thursday friday i won't harp on this during our review because it's not fair but i think it's it's really sad that the fate of the black widow movie is that it came out over a decade too late yeah um, yeah that's it really sucks i think that i think that makes the conversation stink yeah because this as like a lead character in this franchise like she needed her film so much earlier yep. should have been a phase two movie right around winter soldier i think would have been perfect Marvel had started to kind of hit their stride. Um, and I think Black Widow really needed to be shown. It's weird because, you know, she was the only woman on the Avengers and they didn't give her the, they didn't let her stand out on her own. Like, why would she not get a solo movie? We know why. We know that it was because of this, you know, the brain trust that they had. And it was because of uh, what's his name? It's escaping me. He's um, he all, kind the of Trump, the Trump donor. Yeah, the Trump donor guy. Um, why am I blanking? Man, I can't think of it either. Yeah, my uh, Ike Perlmutter. Ike. I was thinking yeah. Isaacson. <laughs> yeah. I was. Ike Perlmutter uh, put the kibosh on a Black Widow movie a long time ago, and said that they weren't going to be making toys of her. That you know, various things, and right. that's what hurt the movie being able to come out but even once we got to captain marvel like why not black widow at that point you know it's yeah even still though captain marvel like came out right before infinity war yeah yeah you know so that was only i mean that was only 2018 it's very strange and it's obviously in like perlmutter thing but you know, Scarlett Johansson was the highest grossing actress in Hollywood for basically the entirety of the 2010s. It was her or Jennifer Lawrence any given year. I it's it's crazy to think that Disney wouldn't want to capitalize on a legitimate movie star. Yeah, and again, I think that there's a lot at play behind the scenes that factors into that. Um, but at the end of the day. I think fans of the characters lose out. Uh, I think Scarlett Johansson lost out because clearly she cares about the Scarlet, um, Scarlet Witch, uh, the Black <laughs> Widow character. Um, and, you know, now the character is gone and this is the end of this character. And this movie feels like it's more about pushing Black Widow 2, uh, mm-hmm. that being um, uh, Florence, Pugh. That Florence Pugh is playing. Yelena Belova, rather than it is about Natasha. And, and, and if this movie had happened 10 years ago, that wouldn't have been the case. Like we never, we never got to see what happened in um, uh, her and Hawkeye. Mm. You know, they always like, what was their relationship? How did that begin? How did Scarlet, or gosh, how did Black Widow, um, you know, go from being, you know, 
a, a bad guy, for lack of a better phrase, um, to a hero, you know? What changed? Um, there's so much meat on the bone that it will never be explored. Yep. I mean, this is it. This is Scarlett Johansson's swan song. Um, it's crazy. I looked up her age. She's only 36. I, I thought with all the years she's been doing this stuff that she must have been in her, like her mid 40s, but like she's still pretty young. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. <sighs> Uh, it's a shame you're right i mean i think i think the fact that this is a movie that should have came out 10 years ago as uh and the fact that the character died two and a half three years ago what is there to get excited for yeah it's a um shame. i'm excited for just for more marvel and yeah you know i i like scarlett johansson um she made me a fan of black widow when i thought that her and hawkeye were the worst um avengers by by far Mm. um she gave that character life and um yeah all that's left for us now is to do the review and you know see the movie and that's it and i hope that it's a good experience uh let's talk about comic book sales everybody's favorite topic twitter doesn't get up for anything like they get up for whether or not comics are selling and what versions of the books are selling. Uh, always a fun time whenever ICV2 and Comicron collaborate to put out their, their joint look at the last year of sales. Um, and so we're going to get into that. Um, so big, the big news, the headline, is that comic sales were up. Uh, they hit a new high during the year that we are referring to as the pandemic year, that being 2020, um, there was a 6% overall increase in numbers. Um, and the number is to the tune of 1.2 billion. So that's a 6% increase uh, from 2019. Mm. I'm pretty surprised. Yeah, this is this is kind of nuts. Um, I, I we kind of talked about this during the pandemic in the very early days of the pandemic, but there clearly was just a need for stuff. Like yeah. people needed to pass the time while they were either unemployed or just stuck inside the whole time. Mm -hmm. And this was something to do. And it looks like like kids' graphic novels especially did really well. And that makes sense too. If you're like a parent and you're stuck with your kid all day, like you gotta give them something. God, anything to shut that little eye. Yeah, exactly. Up. But I guess comics are dying, though. Yeah. <clears throat> um, so Milton Greep, Grep, uh, he's, I think he works for, uh, yeah, he works for ICV2. And this was his summation. He said, the challenges of retailing in the pandemic had profound impacts on the market, including the acceleration of trends that have been in place for years. The book channel increased its share dramatically versus comic stores, and graphic novels increased their share versus periodical comics, while digital sales were turbocharged. Sure. So uh, pulling up the graph here, uh, we can see that uh, the book channel dominated. Uh, six... 145 million dollars were made um through bookstores selling you know comics graphic novels um comic book stores uh, accounted only 440 million uh, i say only that's a huge number but it's you know it's down uh digital saw 160 million and then other channels accounted for 35 million um that's big it, it gets worse when you look at um formats and, and when i say worse i guess i mean like worse for floppies uh mm -hmm. graphic novels or the lion's share of the take 835 million dollars that's big money uh, i mean comp sorry i was just gonna say that's been the trend too when you look over the last five years on this. Yeah. Yeah. Um, definitely. But that's a, that's a big, it's a big difference. Yeah. 
Um, comic regular floppies were 285 million, and then digital was 160 million. So, digital creeping up on floppies, uh, which you know, a lot of people took as a sign that it's time for the floppy to go. We're going to use this data to deal with our main topic, which is whether or not the floppy should be, should go the way of the Dota, whether or not the industry should take cues from th- these numbers and move away from single issues. Um, but before we get into that, I want to read a little bit more from the article from ICB2. Uh, so kids graphic novels did amazing numbers online booksellers did amazing um manga did amazing i believe that this includes manga Mm. which i think really skews the data i really do um i'm not positive but i'm pretty sure it does um miller said the comic periodical market was ahead for the year before the pandemic struck and the result of production cutbacks was that 30 percent fewer new comic books were released by the major publishers in 2020 the fact that new comic sales were down by only 20 percent suggests that retailers did well with what they were able to get that's in reference i believe to the week to the monthly books Mm. um of course we have to account for the seven weeks that diamond was not selling comics to retailers they were not delivering books to retailers and that shut the industry down basically um so much happened you know we have to talk about of course about the lunar and um gosh what was the other one um ucs yes forgot about uh, that. <laughs> yep when dc decided to cut ties with diamond and, and create their own uh, distributors that was a major deal that shook the industry up the fall of diamond in a lot of ways and the rise of these new different um uh, uh distributors marvel now dealing with penguin mm-hmm. uh, it's, it's been a year of upheaval and all that upheaval definitely has impacted the industry at large um without diving into what we're going to be talking about in our main topic what do you guys think about these numbers Well, you got me wondering now about the manga thing because we've talked about many times and over the last couple of months just um, how popular manga really are. And if they're grouping that in with graphic novels, I mean, that could really flub up the whole data here. Yeah. Because it doesn't actually speak to the overall health of, of how Marvel, DC, Image, or whomever's graphic novels are actually selling. Because... Yeah, you know, I don't actually know. For all I know, you know, selling the the, the group volumes of, of One Piece and 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 uh, Hunter X Hunter or whatever could be making up like sixty percent of those sales or something. I, that, that's a that's a I'm being hyperbolic, but you know what I mean. I but, have to imagine that it includes manga simply because like mangas everywhere and manga are comics, so. Mm-hmm. But also, they're, I mean, they're published by American companies, you know, Viz right. and um, Viz Media, yeah. The others, Kodansha, I think, is the American. Nice. Um, but, you know, so they, I mean, they reflect the industry too, as much as, you know, Marvel and DC. Yeah. What are your thoughts, though? I mean, a, a rising tide, you know, sails all ships or whatever the fuck that saying is i think i got that wrong the other day too uh so i'm i'm pumped about this um and i'm frankly i'm uh you know uh i not to get too far into our main topic discussion but i i'm 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 pumped that the discussion of getting rid of floppies is even happening even if it's not happening by the big two uh because i uh, things it means things are shifting and i think evolution especially in terms of you know a fragile market like we've got or seemingly don't have um is good i mean you're famously a trade waiter you know you're you're telling me i'm telling you 
Like, this, I don't know. This this reflects how you do things. All right, let's, let's jump into the main topic because I've got opinions. So I want to lead this conversation off with a tweet. Uh, this comes from Steve Horton on Twitter. And they are a writer of, um, of comics. They do, you know, webtoons, things like that. Um, Eisner nominated. So, you know, you got to... You got to respect that. Um, They said the huge spike in graphic novels and the steep decline of periodical comics in 2020 raises a good question. If you've got an indie comic coming out in 2022, is it a mistake to release it as a single as single issues? Have we reached the age when creator owned only makes sense as original graphic novels? Uh, He says, my guess is it depends on the subject matter. Um, young adult or MG, I don't know what MG means. Get yourself an agent and make it a book as those are incredibly hot. Adult graphic novels is a tougher answer, though the book market is really opening up for those two in the last two to three years. In many cases, though, for adult graphic novels, a well-run Kickstarter might be your best bet of all. That kicked off a lot of, a lot of conversation um he got a ton of responses to this um you know different people adding their perspectives and i really feel strongly that there is a desire in the comic book industry that doesn't really make sense to me um on on the part of fans a lot of the time but some creators too um that we that we shouldn't have single issues, that that, that, that should go away, um, that that's objectively not a good way to distribute comics. And they'll use any shred of evidence to bolster that point. If you look at these numbers and that's what you get out of them, then you're clearly, you're, you're, you're not, you're looking at it from a skewed perspective and you're doing it on purpose. It's like in bad faith. I completely feel that it's a bad faith argument to say that in a year where comic book stores were by and large closed Mm. for much of the time, like we, we, we don't realize it, right? Just because diamond wasn't shipping for seven weeks doesn't mean that comic book stores just automatically opened right after that and got back to business as usual. That's just not the case. Every single online book channel, every single retailer, Barnes and Noble, Amazon were able to continue to sell you trades and things like that while stores couldn't really offer you anything. Um, They didn't have new floppies to sell you. And a lot of bookstores or not bookstores, but comic book shops couldn't sell you anything at all Hmm. because they either didn't have online or they weren't open. And even if they could be open, maybe it wasn't worth opening because people weren't coming to them. It was a huge problem. And it's really easy now to look at 2020 and forget that context, but that shit matters. It matters a lot. Um, There were weeks even after Diamond started selling books again, where not only Marvel, but DC were putting out like, a couple of books, Mm -hmm. literally, Mm -hmm. um, or only collected editions. There were some rough weeks. And that extended well past the seven-week period in which Diamond wasn't putting stuff out. Realistically, Marvel took a break. And they only ramped up. It It took months for Marvel to ramp back up. And it was deliberate. DC did the same thing. They were holding off Batman, if you guys recall. They were holding off Batman. They were not selling Batman because they didn't want to put it out at a time where people weren't buying it, where they they couldn't get to the stores. So they held off on Batman. I I remember a long conversation we had a year ago, I guess it would be now, a little over a year ago, when DC did switch to, uh, they switched away from Diamond and they started, I can't remember this is when they switched to Tuesdays, but a long conversation we had was whether or not what they were doing was responsible or not, because this was at the height of the pandemic. So like we kind of praised Marvel and DC and other publishers for kind of taking a break because we still didn't know a lot about the coronavirus and the idea that they would try to push comics out 
when they did seemed irresponsible. Absolutely. Uh, and, and while that was happening, people were hungry. I think Kale made the point. Um, someone made it that people were hungry for content hmm. and uh, other other places were serving you what you were looking for when it comes to comics and you weren't able to buy floppies. So the idea that graphic novels sold, you know, a ton more than comics, right, you know, than, than floppies. Yeah. I, I believe that, especially when you factor in kids and especially when you factor in manga, I absolutely believe that those markets are the two prevailing markets in comics by far by far you could forget image marvel dc whatever when you're comparing to manga and kids and young adults comics graphic novels you could forget all that other stuff so when you look at this you got to parse that out so what are the real numbers there what are the real numbers when you break down by marvel when you break down by image, how does that change? You know, and we're not talking about that. Mm -hmm. We're not talking about that. If you're a, if you're a, a an indie creator, and I'm going to pass the baton, but if you're an indie creator and you're not making manga and you're not making kids stuff, mm -hmm. this doesn't apply to you in the same way. It's not the same thing. You might as well not even be in the same industry. <sighs> It's not even just the seven weeks that these publishers stopped putting out books. It's also just, you have to really think about the context here. I mean, people that are ordering graphic novels through online channels or from bookstores or whatever, they can get those books shipped to their house from Amazon or wherever in a way that people that buy floppies don't really buy their books that way. Now, there are people that have comic shops that will you know, deliver their floppies to them. But a lot of people like Sean like to go weekly to the shop and pick it up themselves. And that was simply a thing that many people in this country and in Europe were not com comfortable to do even, you know, after we knew more about the uh, coronavirus, even after places start opening up back more because it's a risk. So even now people are vaccinated and not everyone's comfortable like doing stuff like that still and we're yeah. we're you know like six months into this country being like pretty heavily vaccinated Absolutely. so that's an important context here kale you want to add your thoughts um to i guess to address the tr the tweet when i originally read it and this may pivot the conversation or it may just be you guys may just brush it off because it's a pretty, you know, a matter of fact point. But when I when I read creator owned, I was thinking specifically Kickstarter books, you know, people smaller than could be at a publisher, you know, your dark horse, your image, your, you know, people who are technically indie. Uh, but for me, I was thinking Kickstarter. So when the, with the question you know, have we reached the age where creator owned only makes sense as OGN to me? Absolutely. If you are doing an issue number one on Kickstarter, uh, man, I'm sorry. You're, you might be doing it wrong. Why? I, because I mean, it's that, it's that conversation about drop off. Uh, you know, um, uh, nobody sticks around for an issue number two, or the numbers don't stick around for an issue number two, certainly. But also, you know, you're you have a risk in quality that I think you know if you if you don't put out your whole story, if you know that if you don't put out your whole story, then people won't take a risk on issue two, issue three. But if you put out the whole story, you've got it. I don't know. Uh, it's not it, probably not pertinent to this conversation, but that's no. Where... It is. It is. It absolutely is. I think Kickstarter is a huge aspect of it because we know that Kickstarter is is, is arguably the best way to connect with the most people as far mm -hmm. as 
selling your wares. Mm. Um, and it's the most reach, you know, even if you're a, a, a road warrior like Dirk Manning, mm. you know, when he goes to these cons, he can only interact with the people that are at the con. Mm. Um, whereas a Kickstarter, you got everybody. So I think that's a great point. My counter, though, is that that could easily go either way, right? Because, like, for example, for um, butts and seats, I pledged and it cost me twenty something say dollars. Was, sorry, twenty something dollars was it? I want to say it was thirty bucks, thirty to forty bucks for the whole story. Mm. I don't know. I haven't seen art from every single chapter, right? Um, I don't know that I like it. I know I like Dirk and I know I like Tony, but I don't know that the book is good. I'm buying it off faith. Um, mm -hmm. Not everybody is going to be willing to do that because it's $30 is a huge, that's a huge drop in the bucket Yeah. Um, to have to plunk down, especially if, because Dirk Manning, yeah, he's an indie creator, but he's not like, a lot of other indie creators whose right. names you don't know, who don't have followings. Dirk Manning could put out a, a, he could do a Kickstarter and have no press and it'll, you know, it's going to, it's going to reach its, its, its goal in one day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And not everyone can do that. So if you're not that guy, can you get people to say, okay, I pledge $30 for this book virtually sight unseen? It's a big ask. And I'm certainly not denying that, but you know the the thirty dollars I think will go further for your OGN than it will for the issue because it feels I don't know it feel it feels more uh, and this is probably just personal preference, but it feels more worth it to me. Have you ever been at Comic Con? And had that moment where, you know, a creator tries to sell you their book and you're like, oh, okay, yeah, let me, let me check it out. And you kind of peruse it and you can't really read it because like they're there in front of you. It's kind of awkward. Mm -hmm. um, and you're like debate, like, okay, the art's kind of cool. Eh, you know, I got like, I got my money for my lightsaber or my Wolverine claws still that I need to hold on to, I could probably spend like 20 bucks on comics right now today. Is this where I want to spend that 20? How much is it? What is it? Is it, is it a one, one, one issue? Is it two? Is it a, is it a trade? What are we talking about? I've been in that position many, many, many times. Sure. And I can definitely tell you I'm more inclined and this is personal. I'm more inclined to buy the one issue because if it's not a creator that I know, I don't want to spend a chunk of my comic spending in Artist Alley on one person and take this gamble. If it's Christopher Sabella, yeah, I'm in because I like him and I sure. love what he does. You know, if it's um, if you know whoever that I like, but if I don't know them, I'm not doing that. Yeah, and I think I think the con situation is adds another element because you got the guy in front of you, like. I've been in that situation, and of course I'm going to buy it. I'm not going to say no to this guy <laughs> it to his face. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, like you say, I, and like I say, I think, you know, it's probably Kickstarter preference, but I think that's also the, the benefit of a well-run Kickstarter. Well, the one other kind of sidetracking a little bit here uh, on the topic of Kickstarter, it's something we talked about a decent amount uh, during the pandemic in 2020 was um, one thing this article says is that uh, Kickstarter sales contributed to growth of comic funding up to 60% in the last year. Yeah. And, you know, we talked about how a lot of artists were able to put food on their plate through Kickstarter this year because of how devoted comic book readers are to sustaining this trade basically yeah that's a huge i think that's a huge lesson to take away from all this now i don't know how that i don't think that's a long-term growth kind of thing like i think that's an example of readers supporting the creators they like like mm -hmm. sean did with dirk manning in a, in a period in a time period where there was no real other quantifiable way to to back you know 
back your mouth with where the money is or whatever that expression is. Oh now I'm the one God, mixing between up. the two of you. Jesus. Yeah. Um, but you, you get my point is that, 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 that I don't think that's a sustainable model, but that, that Kickstarter was huge for the pandemic. To that point, you know, how many of those Kickstarters have delivered? I feel like it takes so long. Right. Yeah. Um, but I also think that the realities of, of, of what it takes to craft and OGN need to be considered because there's a steep difference in cost and time that it takes to put out or create one issue versus a trade. If your trade is, let's say, six issues, which is pretty standard, you're and you're the writer, you're asking your your art team and everyone else involved, be they editors, letters, letters, whatever, um, to work up front. Mm-hmm. on a whole a whole trade six issues are you fronting that bill yeah again on faith are they gonna take the bite the bullet and not work on anything else and not earn money for that entire time while you're not providing any cash for them and then you put the kickstarter up and you're showing them what the first issue maybe you're showing them pages from the first issue that these artists are working on now what if it fails that's a huge, huge gamble. That's a lot riskier than doing the one issue. I'll compare it to Joystick Angels mm-hmm. um, by T.J. Sterling and his brother. They they did this book, and they clearly have plans for for multiple issues. But they're doing it issue by issue. the The first issue hit its goal in the one day. It it, it shattered its goal in one day. Funded, and we know that additional issues are coming. If it's a trade, that's a bigger gamble. And again, TJ's a guy who can do this. He's very successful when it comes to Kickstarter at this point. But we have friends who do this that we've seen their Kickstarters fail. Mm -hmm. We've seen it. We know them. So I feel like even just because of the realities of putting together a graphic novel that being the way seems suspect to me. Yeah. I, I just, I struggle with that. It's, it costs too much. It's unsustainable. There, it, there's, it, we hear all the success stories, but I mean, honestly, and this is just, this, this goes beyond comic books and original graphic novels with anything that's on Kickstarter what's what's truly the ratio of success on there it's got to be like single digit or something for just the sheer volume of kickstarters that are put up every day I, I i can't speak to that but i know that comic book uh kickstarters have been getting more and more and more successful over the years it's it's, it's tremendous the, the growth mm-hmm. um but yeah i mean for every success there's probably a failure or more than one you know it's probably not one to one yeah uh, go ahead, Gil. Uh, well, I was gonna, I was gonna pivot um, and broaden the conversation past um, yeah. um, Kickstarter. Um, so, you know, Sean, you have opinions. How does this, uh, specifically this tweet, I guess, and you know, you can branch out as you will. But how do you think it affects uh, publishers like Image, like your, you know, your Dark Horse, your Boom, etc. I'm going to go out on a limb and say it doesn't because I think that they are keenly aware as people who were most impacted outside of, you know, retail shops of how the pandemic impacted their ability to reach people. You know, um, I think they understand that, Hey, we couldn't sell copies. I think they look at this and they go, okay, wow. Um, way to make us look bad at a time where we weren't even we didn't even have reach we couldn't we couldn't put books in people's hands um you look past that right and you look at books like berserker and you that that was hugely successful uh you look past that and you look at books like i mean nice house you look at books like something is killing the children even though that started a little while ago that's still doing really well we have books that are doing really really well now that we're out of the pandemic or not out of it, but like 
you know, we're, we're returning to stores and things like that. Yeah. Now that these companies can put books in people's hands, I feel like they look at it and go, okay, we're doing fine. Our business model is working for us. It's, it's tough. Um, the one thing I will say, and this applies to just about like every like company and business model is it's hard to really gleam anything out of 2020 that's for any kind of long-term sustainable growth or whatever. Like I know for a fact, a lot of companies are taking 2021 so far, you know, cause we're halfway through the year and they're trying, they're, they're liking it and comparing it more to 2019 specifically like 2020 for a lot of businesses is just being treated as kind of a write-off year anomalous, all that stuff. So when we look at 2020 for comic books, I mean, it's hard to, it, it's going to be really difficult for creators and these companies to really sift out any lessons to learn here for, for, for moving forward, basically. I, yeah, that's how I feel. I mean, look, the most recent Fast and the Furious movie, right? It did worse than the last one. Does that mean that people are less interested in Fast and the Furious? No, it means that not everyone can go to movie theaters and not everyone is comfortable. Was yeah. the movie a hit by by the standard of uh, where the times we're living in? Yeah, it was. Uh, and I think that you have to look at these numbers in a similar way. I don't think you can just look at them and say, oh, well, this proves it. Uh, the, the floppy is done. You know, the floppy's not done. The, the, there's no way the floppy's done. Um, the, the real question, I think, the, the, the relevant question that no one is asking is how did the coronavirus uh, epidemic, pandemic, impact people's consumption of their interests overall? Are we looking at a people now who more want to consume their media digitally and comfortably we don't know i think we won't know until we've seen some more movies come out a return to theaters are people willing to go back are people willing to go back to comic shops i can only speak anecdotally midtown conference is booming when i go in there that's a big store uh, obviously in times square not every comic shop is going to see those types of numbers but i want to know like are people going back? Our stores, we haven't seen during the coronavirus air epidemic, the height of it, we were re reporting about closures. It felt like every other week. Mm -hmm. We haven't done that. We haven't done it. We haven't seen the, the, the massive like loss of comic book shops that we thought was going to happen. That's what everybody said. It has not happened. Yep. That didn't occur. No, yeah. Why not? If comic book shops primarily are making their bones on floppies, why are they still here? That's not the only thing they sell. Don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to say that's the only thing they sell. But it's where their bread is buttered, right? Yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, when it comes to comic books, you know, the big question that uh, always comes back to with executive types is like growth. You know, uh, when it comes to professional sports, leagues will put teams in cities where they think they can grow the game or whatever based on like the TV market size and stuff instead of putting it in a small market. It seems like with comic books, the one thing you can always say is you have a very reliable, small base that's committed to buying these books no matter what. At the very least. And that's what we saw in 2020. Um, I do want to read a little bit from our Twitter um, as we close out the conversation because we, uh, this was a conversation, um, our Twitter, I'm sorry, our Discord. Uh, this was a conversation. I didn't, didn't know we put anything out on Twitter. <laughs> Y'all want to talk to us. Don't go to our Twitter. Come to the Discord. <laughs> Please, yes, definitely come to our Discord. Uh, and there were some, some takes that I just wanted to, uh, you know, uh, pass over real fast uh marco was really active in the conversation yeah, and he said tracks. i think it makes sense for the indie crowd a lot more 
than large publishers. However, I will say the cost of a graphic novel over a single issue are likely huge contributing factors. Like, do I want to buy this 200 page graphic novel from some unknown creator for $30? Or am I willing to shell out five to $8 for an issue one of a larger story? It comes out more cost effective for both parties, IMO. However, from the response, you can decide whether to go on towards the trade versus an issue two. Uh, 10K goal for an issue one versus 100K for a graphic novel in reference to the, what it costs to get your, your book uh, funded. Um, large publishers can start to lean into the full market and I personally would like that more than single issues. And as backwards as it sounds, unless they make comics cheaper, I'd be more willing to use an issue one as a test of a book's quality before committing to a graphic novel, which overall may come out cheaper in the long run. That's TKO's model. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Viltrum like, Warrior. Sorry, go ahead. Roughly, that's TKO's model. I think there was someone else that actually did that exact thing. Put out the um, number one as a test and then only did the graphic novel. Am I not sure? Does a Wave Blue World do that? It could be a Wave Blue World. Ugh. Sorry. Yeah, I'm not I'm not sure, but there, I know I know that, you're right that there is a publisher. That, that does, does exist, yeah. Yeah. Um, Viltrum Warrior said, uh, a 20 something page preview of an OGN is a great theoretical sample to hand out to potential readers to see if they want to read the whole graphic novel. And unpopular thing, but you've got to make an OGN as cheap as possible on the indie side. Big ask for someone to commit to greater than $20 unless it's got some major bells and whistles. But that's also something about trades. Trades should be loaded like a great DVD slash Blu-ray with extras. Um, mm. I think that you're right that twenty dollars is a much better price point than thirty. But what does that what does that do to the creators? You got to eat that. Mm -hmm. You can't just making it cheaper. Like we can say that, but like where's the profit margin for the creator? Most creators are eating it anyway. Mm -hmm. You know, like the writer is paying everybody um, in, in many instances out of their own pocket. Sometimes just from their day job. Mm -hmm. Like not even from comics money, just their day job that they're spending money to fund these books. And then the expectation on our part, you know, unfortunately is, okay, yeah, but I don't want to spend $30 for this. I want it for 20 or I want it for 15. Why is it so expensive? Image trades are $10. Why am I spending 30? Why am I spending 30 on you when you're unknown, when I could buy Ed Brubaker's uh, uh, new trade at, at image for 20 bucks or the first trade of radiant black for 10 bucks mm -hmm. that's a hard sell my man that is a hard sell and i think marco makes a great point i don't know if it's a hundred thousand dollars that yeah. you need that's his, an exaggeration yeah his numbers feel way huge you don't this need and it, and it doesn't take ten thousand dollars to produce it, it can but it doesn't have to take ten thousand to produce one issue of a comic book. Yeah, he's um, just looking at his own finances. He's like, "How much does a comic cost? Twelve dollars? <laughs> How much could it possibly be?" Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, um, I think there are different ways to look at it. I'm not saying that my way is the or the way that we are presenting here is the only way, um, but I do personally think that there that there needs to be a more nuanced conversation that doesn't start from the place of, okay, get rid of floppies, mm -hmm. which is what it feels like this conversation always comes from that perspective. And I don't think it actually considers all the variables. And if you're an indie creator and you're thinking about how you're going to get your work in people's hands and what the best way to do that is, I think you really have to consider, um, all these different variables i think they really do matter and i think that putting something into the world however you do it is better than not so whether that's anthologies whether that's ash cans whether that's you know five to eight page mini comics whatever you do that's the best way to do it for you because at the end of the day when you're trying to work for boom or image or dark horse or whoever you know they're looking for what have you put out and was it good mm -hmm. not oh wow you funded this graphic novel oh man you know it's not really about that 
It's about, can you do the work? Um, and so if your aspirations are larger than just being that dude that tables at every convention, just trying to make a quick buck or, or, or whatever, you have to think about all this stuff. And so it's an interesting conversation. I think the coming years will really determine the answers to some of this stuff, most particularly to Kale's question about how the bigger publishers will react. Does Image start leaning more into graphic novels? Um, Brubaker and Phillips already do it. Sabella mm-hmm. uh, and Crowded are finish are finishing their run with through graphic novels. Yep, uh, they they decided the to trade. Put, they, yep, they they bundled the whole thing into a trade, the last volume, because the the single issue thing wasn't working out, mm-hmm. and Image let them do this. So. Yeah. One size doesn't fit all in, in mm-hmm. this industry. I firmly believe that. And isn't Marvel with their relationship with Penguin mostly through graphic novels, right? Um, no, I don't. I don't Is that with so. sloppy? Uh, sloppies. <laughs> sloppies. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's what Sean buys is the sloppies. <laughs> oh, man. No, that's what Matt Murphy buys. Yeah. <laughs> they get sloppy after he's done with them. Uh-oh. That's right. Uh, all love. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, like it could lead to more graphic novels, but their, their relationship is, is like, you know, overall. Gotcha. Uh, Kale, you're, you're deep in thought right now. Weren't there, weren't they still with Diamond for the sloppies? That was my Uh, memory. uh, That is what I'm calling them from now (laughs) on, by the way. Um, I don't. I don't know. I don't remember. And I'm not going to try to remember something I don't remember right now. Yeah. My, my um, only point being is right. you can see you can see kind of the trends of moving towards graphic novels, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's exclusively moving toward graphic novels. I don't it, think we can gleam anything with that yet, obviously. Yeah, it doesn't mean the death of the sloppy, for sure. The st- <laughs> Okay, Sloppy one last death, thing. As it were. I, I have to. Uh, there are decidedly very two different ki- types of comic book readers. If you're talking about like American comics, like American, you know, mainstream books, not young adult, not kids, none of that, like Image, Marvel, DC, all that stuff. Yeah. There are people who want to read their books in floppy format. Floppy. And there are, I'm not going to say it. And there are, <laughs> And there are people who want to trade weight. This is a new thing. This isn't a new thing. Is it possible that there are more people, more and more people shifting to wanting graphic novels? I could definitely see that argument, especially um, during this era Hmm. where, you know, people don't want to go out and and expose themselves or whatever. It's easier to say, oh, hey, I'll grab the, um, the trade for Hellfire Gala or I'll grab the trade for Ten of Swords. You know, I don't need it right now. Forget it. I don't want to go risk my life. Mm. I can see that. Long term, where are we going? That's the real question. We can't answer that here on this podcast. Hopefully, we gave you something to think about. We want to hear what you think about this. Write to us at thecomicspals at gmail.com. Make sure that you are following this show. Uh, wherever it is that you listen to it, leave it a rating and a review, whatever you think we're worth. If you are a listener of this podcast on a weekly basis and you have not given us a review on Apple, please do so. If you are a weekly listener of this podcast and you have not subscribed to us on YouTube, please do so. We are six subs away from 400 and we really, really want to get there. So help us out if you haven't. Hit that subscribe button on YouTube like the video, share it with your friends. All those things help us out a lot and they cost you absolutely nothing. When I say nothing, I mean nothing. You literally click subscribe and that's it. And all that means is our content comes up on your feed. And if you don't hit the notification bell, it might not even do that. Um, So help us out. We really appreciate you guys' support and listening. It means a lot to us. Thank you to everybody who wrote in. Thank you to everybody who's having conversations on our Discord server. You should come join that. We're always having a blast over there. Whether we're having deep conversations about the industry or we're being weeby is weeby a phrase that chainsaw man trailer oh baby we getting weeby all up in there (laughs) 
listen to our Multiversity Book Club, read up for our Suicide Squad book clubs, uh, Tom Taylor's Suicide Squad. Uh, check that out. It's a great run. I think you'll like it, especially if you're looking forward to the movie. And listen to our reviews every single Wednesday for Image, every Sunday for everything else, and Wednesdays as well for We Watch Loki. We're doing a lot of content. We hope you are enjoying it. Our Black Widow review will be out next week. Stay tuned for this week, rather, this week. Uh, stay tuned for that. If you're going to check out that movie, you're going to want to hear our thoughts. Kale, you get the top spot this week. Hit us with your plugs. Oh, damn, I'm going to ruin it. You can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Toto in Toe. That's T-O-T-O-I-N-T-O-W. You can find my work at KaleWard.com. That's C-A-L-E-W-A-R-D.com. Um, oh, it's my birthday tomorrow. Yes. Happy birthday. Yeah, Happy yesterday. birthday. Uh, so you're late. That's right. Fourth of July. He's right. a very patriotic boy. Uh-huh. I came out and Uncle Sam said, hold the door. Um, <laughs> what? Uh, you can find Pete at loud underscore Pete. He does a, a Nintendo review podcast. I guess it's a review podcast called Loot Pots. Um, he does it with people. Um, he's this got a band. A he's got a band called Long Friend Time Friend. You can buy their album "If Me Dies, Me Dies" on wherever you get music, and uh, I think they're still doing that vinyl thing. Um, so I don't know. Find Pete and figure that out. I trust you. <laughs> Bill, you can follow me at. Cyborg Bebop on Twitter and Instagram. And uh, you can follow Marco, who is also not here today, uh, at Mr. Marco Animoto. If you really want to capture him and his true element, go to the Weeb channel on the Discord where he's uh, posting disgusting things frequently. Uh, that's all I've got. All right. As for me, you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Sean Soapbox. Uh, hit me up to talk about Black Widow. Let's get hype. Let's get excited. Like Marvel's putting out a movie again. Let's support it. Let's show the world that we are ready for movies again in theaters. If you are, and if you're not, that's cool too. Get it on Disney Plus. Or don't. I won't judge you. With that, here are the Comics Pals signing off. Take care, guys. See you next week. Pick up our sloppies. <laughs> <laughs>